Okay, <laughs> we're back out here again and uh, preaching the gospel message of this life. And this time we have two signs. Today is uh, Thursday, this is the second one. This I got from uh, In Touch Ministries um, last week or the week before. This is from Imago Day Community, and that's my own. So, this is what we're going to be talking about today and uh, celebrating Resurrection Sunday, Easter 2015, and uh, the resurrection of our work. Hi. Hi. This is your view. Yeah. The kindness of your heart. I don't have any money. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah. I can pray for your salvation. Okay. Let's see what we have here. Other than this here. Good morning, Portland. Name is Kevin DeClaren. And just want to take a few minutes of your time to share the gospel with you today. We are uh, we are about to celebrate Easter 2015. So for those of you who believe, Happy Easter 2015. And there are some of you who have not yet made that decision to receive the gospel that God has sent through our Lord Jesus Christ. So I pray that uh, by Sunday, well even after this message or during this message, you would make that decision to embrace God and His Gospel. The only Gospel given to men by the angels, the only Gospel given to men so that they could have a relationship with God by faith through Christ God in his mercy has made us and formed us in his image but has also given us his gospel his good news and in so doing we want to take the time each year to embrace that message of salvation, not just for, for Sunday, Easter Sunday, which is that Resurrection Sunday, but for the rest of our existence, both in the flesh and outside of the flesh, in the body, outside of the body, on earth as it is in heaven. Remember, Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is the will of God for us to embrace his gospel, to embrace his son, to embrace his word, which he has given to all men. No one is excluded except for those who doesn't want to be included. There might have been a time of exclusion 
But for the last 2,000 years, God has opened up his arms in Christ and has welcomed all the nations of the earth to embrace him. You all know the message of salvation. You know that Jesus is the gospel message of this life. When you embrace the Bible, you're embracing the entire gospel from Genesis to Revelations. But before we jump into this, let me say a word of prayer so that God blesses our time together in His Word. Father, thank you for today and thank you for the opportunity to preach your message in Portland. For the people of Portland, for Multnomah County and all the churches both here and abroad no church stands alone outside of your Holy Spirit as holier than thou for we are the church because Lord we acknowledge the fact that we are sinners who are in need of a Savior we're not sinners who are not in need of salvation and forgiveness, but we are sinners who received the salvation of your Son because we acknowledge the fact that we are wicked. Wicked men and wicked women who live wicked lives and who are in need of your forgiveness and salvation. And therefore we are the church because we embrace the message, we embrace Jesus, we embrace his forgiveness, his death, his resurrection. And we ask now, Lord, that you bless our time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of you may have a question. If you could refrain and ask me afterward, I'd really appreciate it. And I'll try to get this as fast as I can. When you go into the, the Bible and you read from Genesis to Revelation, you all know the, the story of the crucifixion of Christ and how he was betrayed by Judas, sold out for 30 pieces of silver. You all know how the Sanhedrin of the Jews and the Roman Empire arrested him tried him, found him guilty, crucified him, and then laid him in a tomb. A couple weeks ago we talked about it, coming out of Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 47. It was raining and it was windy, and I had to move up there to preach because of the rain and the wind. Seems like though we are in the, in, in the spring season, God is still giving us rain and wind and a little bit of sunshine. But we want to come back and finish the story. The story didn't end at his crucifixion and burial in the grave. They had rolled the stone on top of the grave or in front of the cave, wherever they had him buried. They had rolled the stone and uh, the Roman guards basically were kind of, they were wondering whether or not that deceiver, making reference to our Lord, was going to have his disciples was going to have his disciples come and um, have his disciples remove him from the grave to say that he resurrected. And so to make sure that that didn't happen, the Roman Empire sealed the tomb completely with a seal with the Roman seal, as best as they could, to make sure that the, that imposter, that lunatic, didn't come back again to ruin Israel with his false message of salvation, with his false message of deliverance. They wanted to make sure that that lunatic stayed in the grave now that he's been through the Roman Empire. But something happened the next day. And this is what we're here to talk about. 
We're here to talk about the resurrection. Easter is that time of year where we acknowledge not his birth, but his crucifixion, the end of the story of his life, but the beginning of his new life, his new reign, his new commitment, his new direction, one that we were not expecting, one that we were not sure was even true. But that's what Easter is all about. Sort of like the rebirth of Christ. The restart of Christ. The continuation of what began with the gospel message of this life. So we go into the Old Testament. In the Old Testament we find three places where the issue of resurrection of the dead is mentioned. When you open the Old Testament, you will find three passages of scripture where it talks about resurrection. And this is way before the time of Christ. When you go to 1 Kings 17, verses 8 through 24, we find Elijah the prophet having raised a, window, a widow's son from the dead. The prophet Elijah raises a dead son of a widow. So the whole issue of resurrection didn't become with our Lord. It, be, it, it didn't begin with our Lord, but it began in the Old Testament. God began to manifest the power, His power over dead. God began to manifest the power of resurrection in the Old Testament. So we see in 1 Kings, Chapter 17, verses 8 through 24, Elijah raises a widow's son from the dead. When you go into Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 34, or verses 1 through 14, we see Ezekiel the prophet, right? Ezekiel the prophet prophesying for the dead of Israel that the dry bones of Israel to live and for Israel to come out of the grave. So two, two, two different types of resurrection, but we see the manifestation of God's power in the fact that he raised the army, the people of Israel, their dry bones having fallen at war on the ground, and also those who were actually buried in the grave, coming out of the grave to be resurrected. So the power of resurrection went from Elijah to Ezekiel. So God continued, and it's a different time, right? The first time was the time of the kings, when Elijah the prophet was doing that sort of work. But then, when Ezekiel came, remember Ezekiel was the prophet who, was, who came during the time of the 70 years of captivity. Yay! Yay! But there's another passage in Hosea 6.2. I'm preaching the gospel. Would you like to receive Jesus? Yes. I know I'm going to go to the church of the Lord. You would like to... What did you say? I don't know. Oh, okay. Chuck. Yes. Uh, your mommy can pray with you to receive Jesus. No. So. <laughs> so we have another passage of the Bible where the scripture tells us in the Old Testament in Hosea chapter 6 verse 2 that the prophet Hosea prophesies that his people will rise on the third day sort of like Christ talking about the resurrection Hosea, remember, was married to Gomer. God told the prophet to go and take a harlot to be his wife, which was a reflection of the relationship, the marriage relationship that God had with Israel. Every time Gomer sinned, Israel sinned. Gomer was the prostitute that Hosea had to take on as a wife, clean her up, bring her home, to be a wife to him. God did the same thing with Israel who was dirty with the idolatry of Egypt. 
and brought them into a covenant relationship. But Israel, the influence that the devil had on them, could not keep them clean. They kept on going back to the idolatry that they had been influenced by in Egypt. It remained in their system throughout the years, even until the time of Hosea. And Hosea was an Old Testament prophet. So we see three prophets in the Old Testament talking about the resurrection of the dead. Jeremiah, who does it directly. Ezekiel, who prophesies of it coming to pass. And also Hosea, the prophet, who also prophesies, who also prophesied, who also prophesies of the coming, uh, not of the coming, but of the resurrection of his people, sort of like the resurrection of Christ. But then when we come into the New Testament, in the New Testament we find several examples, again, of the issue of resurrection. The resurrection of the dead prior to Christ's death and resurrection. What is God trying to tell us, America? The resurrection of dead people did not begin with Jesus. The, de the resurrection of the dead did not begin in this passage we find in Mark chapter 16. It began way before that in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament time, when Christ came on the scene, guess what he did? He continued that process of resurrecting the dead to show humanity that he had power over the living and the dead. So that when it came time for him to be resurrected and to come back into, into life, it wasn't a surprise because he'd been doing it for so long among the Jews and of the Old Testament, among the people of the New Testament, and then for him to do it to his own body. But it doesn't stop there. So when we go into the New Testament, we see in Matthew 10, 8, Jesus commanding his 12 disciples to raise the dead as part of their new, new work for his ministry to God. We see in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus giving instructions to the twelve for the first time, sending them out to do the work that he himself had begun. He says to them that they are to raise the dead. They are to cure the sick. They are to cure the blind. But they are also to raise the dead. When we look at the Gospel of John, John chapter 11, verse 43, we see that Jesus demonstrates that power to raise the dead by raising Lazarus of Bethany to come out of the grave saying Lazarus come forth Lazarus come forth imagine your brother having died and Christ comes to the tomb and calls your brother out of the grave we see also in Mark chapter 5 verses 21 through 24 and verses 35 through 43, Jesus raising Jairus' daughter from the dead, a second example of what he had commanded the disciples to do as the work of God in the New Testament. We see in Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17, Jesus again raising a young man from the city of Nain from the dead. Three clear examples of Christ's power and the ability to bring the dead back to life. Can you imagine in our generation someone raising the dead? Can you imagine someone going to a funeral like Jesus did? Or stopping a funeral procession like Jesus did? And calling the man to get up out of the box, out of the casket, and to come alive? You know, that's what the gospel does. The gospel resurrects our spiritual lives because we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And what the gospel does is the gospel gives us back the life that we lost in the Garden of Eden. The Spirit of God comes upon us and empowers us spiritually to seek after God, 
and to love God and to pursue God and not to pursue sin. Whenever you see a Christian, whether myself or anybody pursuing sin or doing sin, like sometimes I do, it's not because the power of God is not in us, it's because we have done what? We veered from the way long enough to give power to the flesh. But if we were walking by the Spirit, we would not be carrying out the desires of the flesh. So God tells us to preach the gospel in season and out of season, to resurrect the spirit that may be in you today back to life so you could to restore and replenish faith back in, the, in those of you who might have grown in the Christian faith to remind you to empower you to walk with God again and not to give up before I came out earlier I was lamenting and praying to God and I was saying Lord my ministry has become a sham a scam the people of this nation, they don't see me as a, as a minister, they see me as a queer. They don't see me as a pastor, they see me as a puppet. They don't see me as a leader, they see me as a loser. They don't see me as a minister, they see me as a menace to society because of the gospel that I'm preaching that is not resulting in their salvation, that is not resulting in their forgiveness of sin, that is not bringing them and drawing them like the fishes who are drawn in. On that day when Jesus stood on the beach and said to Peter, why don't you throw your net on the other side after fishing all night? And what did Peter do? Peter obeyed the Lord reluctantly, took his net and threw it on the other side. And what came up? 153 fishes or 150 fishes. But the net was filled. The net was filled with fish. And Peter's prayer was, was, was what? It was answered. Because it was the time for Christ to manifest and demonstrate his power even over fish going in a net. Even over fish going in a net. Not only the power of the gospel saving souls from sin, but fishes going into a net. To take away doubt. To take away fear. And to bring forth salvation. Why aren't you saved today, Portlanders? Why do you have no faith in God, Portlanders? Why is it you're allowing another Easter to come by, Portlanders? Faith in God, dude. Why is it that even today, now, you resist the Spirit of God from coming upon you? Because I got to listen to you. Do not let Satan deceive you. Do not let right Satan there. discourage you. Do not let Satan remove the seed of salvation from you. Do not let Satan use your unbelieving heart to discourage others. The message of salvation is to what? Is to save your soul from God's wrath. Not to insult you. It's to bring you into a faith-based relationship with God, your creator who has made you in your mother's womb. Your savior who has died on the cross to save you from your sin. So we see in the New Testament, as well as in the Old Testament, that God has been raising the dead since the beginning. It didn't begin with Christ. So we come to our message that Jesus died and rose again in Mark chapters 15 and 16. When we look at the Gospel of Mark, for 15 chapters, Mark informs his readers about the life, leadership, ministry, and established church, apostolic, and messianic authority of Jesus Christ. Jesus is known as the Christ, Son of the living God. the Messiah, the Son of the Most High God, out of the mouth of demons, out of the mouth of the disciples. When you look at Mark chapter 5 and 7, the Holy One of God, they said, in Mark chapter 1 verse 14, are you here to torment us? The devil knew who he was. The leaders 
of Israel knew who he was. The Sanhedrin and the Roman Empire knew who they were persecuting. It's almost like in their mind, they didn't want to receive they didn't want to receive the blessing that he had of salvation. And as we saw last time that I preached in Mark 15, he was also known as the guilty king of the Jews. He was condemned as the guilty king of the Jews. Men have been condemned for murder, insurrection, lying, cheating, stealing doing some of the most heinous of crimes. But who will you find in human history that has been condemned as being king of the Jews? As being king, whether Jewish or not, it's irrelevant. But for the man having worn the crown, and was it because Jesus himself said, I am the king of the Jews? Or was it that it was being attributed to him for all the powers that he had demonstrated? For this title, Jesus was betrayed. For this title, Jesus was sold, condemned, scourged, crucified to die on a Roman cross. Imagine telling the people, I'm the manager and the owner of Starbucks. I'm the owner of Chase Bank. I'm the owner of the Pioneer Courthouse. And then a mob forms to kill you when you show them the deeds to the property when you open the vault and show them that every penny belongs to me and to the people who bank here. Every coffee bean is mine. Purchase. Every cup. Every machine. My own. But the people become angry at the fact that you've demonstrated this power. The power of ownership. The power of riches. And they become so jealous in their heart at the fact that it is you who have all of this and they have nothing that they, be, they turn in their hearts against you. This is what happened to the Son of God. When they saw the demonstration, they couldn't care less what he was wearing on the outside. They couldn't care less if he was wearing, you know, uh, uh, designer pants or designer robes. But the fact that he demonstrated the power to feed thousands, the fact that he demonstrated the power to walk on water, the fact that he demonstrated power to resurrect the dead, it enraged the spiritual leaders of his day. It enraged the spiritual leaders of his time. The people who were recognized were infuriated at the Son of God that would come through the cloak of a carpenter's son. The cloak of a carpenter's son. He didn't look like Caesar. He didn't talk like Caesar. He wasn't educated as Caesar. He didn't have the Roman guard in Roman Empire, 600. He didn't have any of that. All he had was the power of heaven. And that was enough without the external garbs. So at 3 p.m. on Friday afternoon, before the Passover began at 6 p.m., Jesus cried and asked God why he has forsaken him. Then breathed his last and gave up his spirit and died. All this for three and a half years to reestablish a line of communication with God. To put an end to the Old Testament atonement system. What was that Old Testament? atonement system, killing of the animals and using their blood and, pre and presenting that, the blood of the goats, the blood of the bulls and the blood of the birds on an altar by the Jewish priesthood. The Levitical priesthood of Israel did this for how many centuries and it resulted in nothing. And when you go into the book of Hebrews, what do the Hebrews say? What does the book say? It was pointless. So Jesus comes down once and for all time to offer himself as a sacrifice on God's cross. To inaugurate communion, the bread and the cup. 
as his new covenant with Israel and the church. For salvation to come. All this for three and a half years to reestablish, to inaugurate the communion table, the new covenant with Israel and the church. All this for salvation to come to all those who believe in his death and to all those who believe in his resurrection. Not everybody believed in his resurrection, but many believed in his death. You can't have one without the other. If we all received his death, but not his resurrection, then he's not demonstrating the power that he had promised to demonstrate. That he himself also had the power of resurrection over his own life. He gave up his life and he takes it back up again. That is what makes Jesus Christ Lord. It is the fact that he laid down his life and he took it back again. The fact that he laid down his life and he took it back again, like drinking a cup of coffee. I could put it down. I could pick it back up. I could put it down. I could pick it back up. How easy is this for the Son of God to take up his life and to put it down? The demonstrate of that power is what has been in question since the beginning. Did he, did he really resurrect from the grave? Because that's what confirms his divinity as Lord and God. It wasn't just the fact that he was crucified, because what? All of the criminals were crucified. How many Romans or slaves or people from among the Jews who committed crimes, they used to be lined up. It's like taking every single one of those poles that you see here and putting another another board and then crucifying someone on every single one of those poles. That's how it used to be in Roman times. They would line them up coming into Jerusalem or, or leaving Jerusalem or whatever the city was. The Romans would have dead people crucified on crosses. But the amazing thing which God did was he took that Roman hit and then he said in three days I'm coming back to show you the power that the rest of these criminals did not have which I have which makes me God over life and death so all this for salvation to come to all those who believe in his death and resurrection all this for them to receive God's gift of the Holy Spirit. For 2,000 years, the church has remembered Jesus' sacrifice and demonstration of God's love on the cross for the sins of the world. Taking on God's wrath for all who believe in His name. The only name under heaven by which men, humanity, can be saved from Satan, saved from a life of sin, saved from God's eternal damnation and wrath. Would you like to be saved? You simply need to pray, lay down your sin on God's cross, at the foot of the cross of Christ, so that the blood of His salvation can save you from your sin. And you can be born again today. Be saved from this perverse generation and receive Christ as Lord. Be saved and lay down your life at the foot of the cross of Christ. And receive His forgiveness and Holy Spirit. Last week or the week before, we looked at Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 47, but was cut short when my laptop died because I ran out of battery juice. But we want to finish that message, right? When we looked at Mark, we saw the trials, the betrayal, the scourging, the crucifixion, and the death of Christ. 
We saw in Mark 15 verses 1 through 5, Jesus was on trial. He was questioned if he was the king of the Jews, if he was the king of this life, if he was the king over you and I. We saw in Mark 15, 6 through 15, Jesus betrayed by multitude and scourged to be crucified. The same people he healed, the same people he fed, the same people he resurrected from the dead turned against him. We saw in Mark 15, 16 through 20, Jesus endures the Roman soldiers' praetorium mistreatment. We see in Mark 15, 21, Jesus, Jesus' cross is carried by Simon, perhaps an African. And remember, we said that the Africans were the ones who received him in Egypt when he, his parents had to flee. And we said that at the beginning of his life, the Africans helped save him. And now at the end of his life, the Africans helped carry his cross for him to be crucified. We saw in Mark 15, 22 through 32, Jesus crucified as king of the Jews with two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. We saw in Mark 15, 33 through 41, Jesus cried and breathed his last. We saw in Mark 15, 42 through 47, Jesus buried in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. What is it that God did not tell us about the crucifixion of his son? What is it that God did not tell us about the crucifixion of his son? I want to read to you the last portion of Mark's Gospel, Mark 16. Mark 16, verses 1 through 20, says this, And when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices, that they might come and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen, like the sun is risen now and has been up there for several hours since 6 a.m. this morning. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Now remember, the stone was sealed by the Roman Empire so that no one would enter the tomb, so that no one would disturb the body, so that the disciples would not steal his body and pretend that he had resurrected from the dead. So in verse 3 of Mark chapter 16, Mark says this, and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe. And they were amazed. And he said to them, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going before you into Galilee. There, you will see him just as he said to you. And they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Do you believe that we had a president called George Washington? Do you believe 
that we had a president called Abraham Lincoln. Do you believe that we've had those presidents 200 years ago? Then why do you doubt that 2,000 years ago, the Son of God walked among us, spoke among us, lived among us, and was resurrected among us? Why do you doubt? How did you get here? Where were you in the 1900s? Where were you in the 1800s? Where were you in the 1700s? Where were you in the 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1? All of that time, where were you? Where were you? Why weren't you there? In all that history, why were you not walking with those people? Why were you not fighting in their wars? Why were you not riding their chariots, marrying their women, having children among them? Why were you not there when Washington walked on American soil? When Jamestown was first established in the East? Where were you when the Titanic sunk in the early 1900s? Neither was I. That means there's a time before you and I where God was there, we weren't there, and he was doing some things that we can only read about in the history books. This Bible, this gospel, is a history book of God's activities. Do not insult the Lord like you would not insult your historians by saying there never was a Washington, there never was a John Smith, there never was a Titanic. No, we have pictures of those people. We have writings and documents saying that those people existed. The same way you would not insult your historian, neither should you insult the authors of scripture who have penned the history of God's son. Someone is writing your history right now. Someone has you in the history books. And you may say, well, I'm nobody. No, when you go into the hospital and they look up your baptism, where you were born, you are in the history of this generation. There are generations to come. You know, sometimes you go online and you want to look at your ancestry, ancestry.com, and you go back as far as the civil, uh, the, the civil war, and you find pictures and peoples and you find your name you weren't there at that time and neither was i but you look and you admire those people because it's because of them that you are alive today it's because your father and his father and his father and his father produced children and now you are here and i am here when you read the scriptures that's what's going on here we're looking at the history of the Christ, the God-man. So don't doubt. If you don't doubt your history books, neither should you doubt the history of God's son, Jesus. So let's continue in Mark 16. Mark says this in verse 9. Now after he had risen early on the first day of the week, he first appeared to Mary, Magdalene, or Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. Three days had passed and they're still crying over the man. Verse 11, and when they heard that he was alive, and had been seen by her, they refused to believe. Sort of like what we're doing today. Refusing to believe. Verse 12. And after that, he appeared in a different form to two of them 
while they were walking on, along on their way to the country. And they went away and reported it to the others. But they did not believe them either. The disciples were not believing in his resurrection. Verse 14. And after he appeared to the eleven themselves, as they were reclining at table, and he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Maybe what I'm feeling in my heart is Gabriel Franklin denying the faith, resisting the faith, so that you don't believe the faith, and you don't believe the message. Maybe the, she, the government has hidden her somewhere. Remember at his, uh, as his, at his crucifixion, it was probably just as dark, just as windy, and uh, just as turbulent. We may have to move the sermon up there if God decides to pour his rain. on us. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. believe. <laughs> Thank God. The wind keeps knocking this off. There was an earthquake on the day that they crucified him. Hopefully we won't have one of those tomorrow. <laughs> As a reminder. So in verse 14, Mark says this. And afterward he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at table. And he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who have believed in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it shall not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then, when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirm the word by the signs that follow. I had to make sure we weren't going to run out of juice again so I could actually finish this message for you as a city.
So we see in Mark 16, verses 1 through 20, the first return of the King of the Jews from the dead. When we look at Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 20, what are we looking at? We're looking at the first return of the King of the Jews from the dead. And there is a second coming, a second return, but that's not until the future, which I consider the future exodus of the church, which we call the rapture. So we see in Mark 16 verses 1 through 8, Jesus resurrected by an angel's testimony. By an angel's testimony. When you, when you think about it, you can ask the question, whatever happened to the tomb where Jesus was laid? Who or what is occupying that tomb? That cave, that place where he was laid? We see in verse 1, three women on Resurrection Sunday having visited the tomb to anoint his dead body. We saw at sunrise on Sunday, the three women were there at the tomb the first day of the week. We see in verse 3, the tomb was sealed and enclosed by a large stone. The Romans didn't want the body stolen. Where's the truth of Portland at? I am the Church of Portland. Oh, there it is. As Christ is the head of the church. And in verse 4, we see that someone had removed the large stone. Who is it that could have removed the last stone if it wasn't God or any of his angels? Who could have removed that stone if it wasn't for God or his angels? We see in verse 5, the tomb was not empty. An angel in white robe sat there where Jesus was laid. God sent a young angel to do what? To speak on behalf of Christ. When we look at verse 6, we see the angel testifying that the crucifixion of Jesus had actually happened and that the crucified Christ rose from the dead. God in Christ has returned back to life again. His work of atonement was permanently completed for all generations, for all eternity, forever and ever. This was a restart for the Son of God. It was an angel who introduced him the first time in Luke 2, 11 and 12. And it was an angel who let him go in Acts chapter 1, 10 through 11. It was an angel who introduced him in Luke chapter 2. It was an angel who told Mary that she was going to have a son and she shall call his name Jesus. It was an angel upon his resurrection upon him coming back into this life who told the women that he had risen from the grave and upon his ascension it was an angel who told them why are you sitting there looking what are you looking for this Jesus who has ascended will also return on a cloud the same way he went is the same way he shall return how did you get here through your mother's belly. How did you get into your mother's belly if it were not an act of God? How did your spirit leave your body upon your death? 
Why is your body buried and nobody knows where your soul has gone? Are these not the mysteries of God? Are these not the mysteries of God? How you enter into life, how you exit into life, and where you have gone? Are these not the mysteries of God? Our creation, or living here, and our ascension, either into heaven or into that place called hell. But some of you says there is no hell. How would you know? You don't even know where you came from. So the same angels that introduced him are the same angels that brought him back into the society of that day. And the same angels who watched him ascend up into heaven and says that he's coming back. It's not over yet. Is not the rain an act of God? Is not the sunshine an act of God? So is the resurrection of the dead from the Old Testament to the New and the resurrection of the Christ. So in verse 7, the angel gave the women instructions of who they are to tell, where to meet him, as he had prophesied. So when you go into Mark chapter 16, verse 7, the angels told the women to go tell his disciples. Don't let Satan distract you with unbelief. Don't let Satan distract you with the flesh. Don't let the, the devil distract you from what could be an opportunity for you to be saved. Satan is full of distractions. He is full of enticement, sexual enticement, physical enticement to the body, the body that you're going to leave behind. The world entices your flesh so that you ignore your soul's need for salvation. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What does it profit a man if his body is all built up like a bodybuilder and his bank account is all built up like a millionaire and his beauty is beyond, surpasses everybody else's, but he's got to leave the bank, he's got to leave the body, and he's got to leave the beauty on the dead on a dead man's face. But yet his soul has been forsaken because he never took the time to pray. He never took the time to believe. He never took the time to receive the gift of God, the gift of salvation for his soul. The message is for your soul salvation, not for your bank account, not for the beauty of your face, not for the beauty of your body, not for the strength of your body. It's for your soul salvation. God wants us to move this ministry up there.
Okay. Yeah. I wasn't expecting rain. I'll pray for sunshine. Let the rain be a testimony to the power of God this Easter. Let the rain be a testimony to what God has been showing us all the days of our lives. And oftentimes, we suppress the truth. We forget that it is the power of God that is doing these things. Making those beautiful flowers. Making our beautiful children. Making the food. And making us all of these things are the gift of God. Why are they the gift of God? Because He loves us. And so is this gospel message. The gospel is given to us so that we could draw near to Him. You may say, well, I don't feel the power of the Holy Spirit in you, brother. Nobody's coming to salvation. The one who gives the Holy Spirit is God. The same one that gives us the rain. The same one that gives us the children. The same one that gives us this gospel. You mustn't trust in my powers to give you the Spirit. You must trust in the power of Christ. When you read Jeremiah 17, the Word of God says, Have what? Do not trust in man, but trust in God. Your faith is in the Lord. Your trust is in the Lord. Because your salvation is in the Lord. Not in the preachers of this nation, not in the pastors, not in the churches, not in the U.S. government, not in the papacy, not in any group, not any amount of money. Our faith is in God who makes it rain and who gives us sunshine and the four seasons. Let's finish this message. So we see in Mark chapter 16 that in fear the women left the angels and they left the tomb without a word. They were probably shocked. They were probably bewildered. This was their first time dealing with God's angels. It's not every day women see angels. We've been here for 50, 60, 70 years and we don't even know what the angels of God look like unless they come out on television. And that's another subject in itself. We see that Christ's resurrection was supported by heaven. We see that His birth was supported by heaven. His life was supported by heaven. His death and resurrection and ascension was supported by heaven's angels who were sent by the Father. 
We see that he is supported in all his work, even up to the point of his death and return to life in subjection to God the Father. Jesus subjected himself to the Father even with all of his power. Why are you and I not subjecting ourselves? Why are we exercising no faith in the Father? Why do we live by the gun in this nation and not by God? Why do we live as fags in this nation instead of by faith? Why do we love the flesh so much but we forsake the Spirit who is there and available for us? If we were to conclude the first eight verses of Mark chapter 16, we see that heaven and earth met in Christ. Heaven and earth met in Christ's home, angels and men, to affirm that His words were fulfilled. Did not Jesus say that He was going to be resurrected? Does not this angel affirm His words upon His resurrection? We see that Scripture had come to pass both Old and New Testament. We see His angels, His messengers, His forerunners, once again, now prepared humanity for, for the second part of His commission in contact with man. The angels prepared us again in the Gospel of Matthew. When you read about Mary's account, what did the angel prepare Mary for? You're going to have a son, and his name shall be Jesus. And he shall save his people from their sins. Do you believe it? Did he save you from your sin? Did he save you from your sin? He accomplished his first divine task. Now it's time for him to pass on this leadership, this ministry, to one who will continue on his behalf to prepare them for God. God number three, to prepare them for the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words, my words will come to pass. The heavens will fall, the earth will shake, but my words, what my words will do, it will shock you. So he prepared them for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit has come. We see that in the, in the Gospel, actually in Acts, written by Luke. But we want to continue and finish. In Mark 16, 9 through 11, Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene, and the disciples didn't believe it. We see in verse 9, Jesus appeared to Mary, a woman who, who had possessed demons. You know, when you read uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26, I want to read that passage to you. Paul, having written to Timothy, says this. Paul says, And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Paul is preparing his protege, his disciple Timothy. Paul was preparing Timothy for, for full-time ministry. And he's saying to them, some people are going to be held captive by Satan to do his will. Mary Magdalene was one of those women who was being held captive by Satan's demons, seven of them, to do his will. How many of us in this American society are doing the devil's will? How many people in this American society do you know of that is being held captive by Satan? You may look at a person and go, oh, well, she's a very nice woman. But she's a child molester. Oh, he's a very nice man. But he's killed three or four people. You see, we don't know whom the devil is holding captive to do his will. We see it on America Online, looking for fugitives. We see it in, 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 those, in, in that uh, TV show, Snapped, 
Men killing women, women killing men. Women killing children. Children shooting other children in schools. We see it in the movie, The Omen. Or what's the name of that movie where the little girl's head begins to twist? We see it in Chucky, even a doll. So Mary Magdalene, who lived 2,000 years ago, is no different than the women in this generation or the men in this generation. I just recently was at Powell's and I looked up the Church of Satan. Do you know that there is an actual group who call themselves the Church of Satan? Let me tell you something. Separate the word church from Satan. Satan doesn't have a church. Satan may have an assembly of disobedient people, but he doesn't have a church. God has a church because it is those who possess the Spirit of God that are the church of God. Having a demon inside of you doesn't make you God's church or Satan's church. It may make you demon possessed, but it doesn't make you a church. The church are saved Jews and Gentiles who have been brought near by the blood of Christ, according to Ephesians chapter 2. So we see in Mark 16, Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene, a former demon-possessed woman belonging to Satan. Jesus snatched her out of his hands. Don't you want Jesus to snatch you out of the hands of the enemy? Don't you want Jesus to snatch you? Don't think for a minute that your money will save you from Satan possessing you by the demons that are, abide in the hearts of the unbelieving. Don't think for a minute that the devil will release you or let you go because he will never let you go unless God sends his son into your heart to remove the devil that may be in you. In verse 10, Magdalene reported to the disciples that he appeared to her. They were grieved at his loss. And they doubted the report. And they didn't believe it. Why is it that you don't believe it today? And I'm not talking to those who believe it. I'm talking to the ones who deny it. I'm not talking to the ones who believe it. I'm talking to the ones that are hissing in their heart and going, you're a lying, stinking homosexual. You're a sinner just like us. We've seen you in places. We know what you do in the darkness. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the spirit of sin and death. Because you are saved, it doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. The righteous man falls seven times. But he gets back up again to keep running with God. That's why the word forgiveness is in the Bible. God is ready to forgive. Psalms 85 or Psalms 86, 5. God didn't say upon your salvation, you shall be this perfect Christian. And you're going to walk uprightly. And you're going to be holier than thou. And righteous in all your ways. No, God did not say that. He says for us to seek his, the salvation of our souls. He said to pursue righteousness. Pursue holiness. Pursue godliness. But it doesn't mean that Satan is not going to want to you know, sift you like wheat. It doesn't mean that you're not going to stumble once in a while. Even David, who was king of the Jews, lusted after Bathsheba and committed murder to sleep with her. The man after God's own heart. The man who wrote psalms and poetry. The man whom the, the nation loved. The man who killed Goliath. Committed murder for a woman. So don't think for a minute that Christians, whether on television or off television, or in your churches or in the streets, are going to walk this perfect, upright relationship and that they're never going to have lusts and struggles with what? With the flesh. 
That's why we've been given forgiveness. That's why we've been given grace. Grace. And abounding in grace. And loving kindness and mercy. So they did, doubted the report. And they didn't believe. If we were to wrap up this uh, two or three verses of Mark 9... Uh, no, Mark 16 verses 9 through 11 Jesus reaffirms Mary's faith when he appeared to her and his lordship over her assuring her the demons will not enter you again Mary you will not have another seven demons inside of your heart and your soul he sent her to prepare the, the other disciples for his coming for his appearance. You see, his death was not the end of his relationship with his disciples. It was the restart again, the continuation. Now with Mary, a disciple, not Mary, his mother. Remember when he came into this life, it was with Mary and Joseph. It was a woman named Mary that began Jesus and now again a woman named Mary begins him again but Mary Magdalene she is the testimony of his power when he was alive and when he came back she is the testimony of his resurrection and the testimony of what of the continuation of his life and his ministry the first Mary brought him into the world at his birth now that he is born or reborn into the world, another Mary brings him back into the fellowship with his Jewish brethren. First the angels, then Mary, then the brothers, just like when he was born. First the angels, then Mary, then the disciples. The brothers, the men whom the Father had given to him out of the world, According to John 17, 6, his priestly prayer while he was in the Garden of Gethsemane before he took that solid hit from the Roman Empire, that solid hit from the Sanhedrin, that solid hit that put him in the grave. We see in Mark 16, verses 12 through 13, Jesus appears to two of the disciples. He didn't go to the twelve right away. He went to the road and found two by themselves leaving Jerusalem to go to another city and in verse 12 like the transfiguration he began to appear in, in different forms to the disciples they didn't even recognize him one of them was named Cleopas and of course there was another disciple with him if you want to know you have to read the account in Luke 24 Luke 24, 13 through 35 tells of the account how the disciples were walking and, and they were leaving that uh, Jerusalem where all of this stuff had been happening beginning in Friday. And then of course he was in the tomb on Saturday. And then Resurrection Sunday, they're walking out of Jerusalem talking about all that had happened. The earthquake perhaps. And of course how the temple split in half. And now he was resurrected. You know what the Bible says? When Jesus resurrected, when you go to Matthew chapter 27, 28, the Bible says when he resurrected, there were also disciples whom probably had died when he was dead or before he had died that resurrected with him. So it wasn't just the resurrection of the son, but it was also the resurrection of whom? Of other disciples. And they began to go throughout the city, probably looking for their families. Jerusalem was probably in an uproar. The shock of so many dead people coming back to life. The, the Roman Empire didn't know what to do. So they started paying their, their guards to go around and tell the people that his disciples had stolen his body. There is a Catholic cemetery up the hill. If you catch the 20 bus, it will take you directly to that cemetery. If you go across the river and you walk that way, probably to 20th Avenue or 24th, 
There's a cemetery up there. Imagine Jesus living in our day. On Friday, tomorrow at 3 p.m., he is, he is pronounced dead by the Portland Police Department. And on Saturday, they go and they make sure that his tomb is sealed. And on Sunday, he resurrects. And all the people that are out here in, in, the, in the Pioneer Square area are, ch are chanting that Jesus shouldn't have been crucified. And they're angry. And the police department decides to open fire. And, and begin to kill the followers of Jesus in our day. And on Sunday, when he is resurrected, all of those followers come back to life with him. After they've been buried. This is the power of God on display. You have to read all four accounts of the gospel to see what I'm saying to you. So in verse 13 of Mark chapter 16, Cleopas and another disciple returned to Jerusalem and related to them all that occurred with Jesus on the road and at the dinner table as related in Luke's gospel chapter 24, 13 through 35. When they got to the city after leaving Jerusalem, they were sitting at the table eating, sort of like this one right here. And Jesus took bread and he broke it. And the way he broke the bread and passed it to them, their minds were open. And they saw him for who he was. And when they saw him for who he was, he disappeared. And they ran back to Jerusalem to tell the other disciples what had happened with them on the road and at the dinner table. You may turn if you want to, but don't turn from the Son of God and His Gospel. You may not have faith. You may choose not to believe. You may deny this message coming from me, but don't deny what the Word of God and the Spirit of God is saying to you individually. You may say that I'm a charlatan and false, but do not call God a liar, because He is telling us the truth. So during these uh, 40 days, Jesus appeared to Cleopas and another disciple and traveled with them for about seven miles from Emmaus to Jerusalem. They were going to Emmaus. They went there, got there, had a meal. Jesus came out. So they ran back to tell the disciples that our Lord is alive. He has risen from the grave. It's like your grandmother coming and knocking on your door after she had just been buried two days ago. What in the world is grandma doing that? She was a believer. She stood with the Christ. And she says, I have come back, children. Jesus has risen. Imagine the shock of grandpa and the grandkids. That grandma standing at the door. The mom, I mean, people would have been fainting all over the place for this resurrection to have happened here in Portland in our day. Imagine what the world would have said about Portland, Oregon. That the resurrection had taken place here. This is modern day Jerusalem for us. So we continue in Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 14 through 18. Jesus appeared to the eleven finally and sent them to preach the, to preach the Gospel to all creation. We see in verse 14, Jesus appeared to the eleven in Jerusalem and rebuked their unbelief. Like the Lord has rebuked several of you during the time of my preaching. Rebuked their unbelief that he overcame death. The same way he raised all those people, Lazarus, the daughter of Jairus, and the young man whom they had stopped the funeral procession and he's told the young man to get up. Lazarus, come forth. Jairus, go get your daughter something to eat. She's not, she's not dead, she's only sleeping. The disciples did not believe that he could raise himself from the dead. We see in verse 15, Jesus commissioning his disciples a third time. You know, when you look at Matthew 10 verses one, through 42, 
Jesus commissioned his disciples. This is prior to his, his death. He commissioned the disciples and told them to go like sheep in the midst of wolves. And he sent them out by twos, the 12 of them. And then when, we, when you look at Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 20, we see Jesus amassing about 70 disciples. And he sends them out again by two with the same powers to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out demons. So we see in Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 15, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Go into all the world. What he told them, the twelve, what he said to them, the seventy, and what he probably said to the hundred and twenty, and what he probably said to the five hundred, what he probably would have said to the three thousand, and what he probably would have said to the five thousand and the multitude. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Jesus called the message for the first time the gospel. He uses the word gospel to talk about the message of his life. He uses the word, the word gospel to talk about the teachings. Remember, he said to the disciples in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. What is he talking about? The gospel. His life is called the gospel. His teaching and his ministry is called the gospel. His leadership and discipleship it's called the gospel. Angels call it the good news of salvation. His death and resurrection. Everything that Moses wrote about him is the gospel. Everything that the prophets wrote about him is the gospel. Everything that the apostles wrote about him is the gospel. Message of this life. We see in, in, in verse 16, where he says, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. But he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Jesus concluded and added this condition. Those who believe the gospel and have been baptized of the Holy Spirit, according to John 1.33, according to Romans 8.12-21, they will be saved. Those who do not believe and who mock and who ridicule will be condemned. Revelations 20, 11 through 15. Revelations 21, 8. We see in verse 17, Jesus says, And these signs will accompany those who have believed in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink deadly any deadly poison, Jesus says, it shall not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So Jesus added another condition to the believers. The disciples of, of the first century. The signs that will manifest. That is the casting out of demons. Like he did for Mary Magdalene. They will speak in new tongues, languages. When you read Acts chapter 2, verses 4 through 13, we see that at Pentecost, we see that at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, the scripture says this in Acts chapter 2, and when the day of Pentecost had come, 
They were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves and they rested on each one of them. Is your lack of faith me? Or is your lack of faith you? Do you not have faith because of me? Or do you not have faith because you choose not to believe? And in verse 4, the scripture says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. What Jesus told them in Mark's Gospel came to pass in Acts. Acts chapter 2. Scripture says, There were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were bewildered because they were each one hearing them speak in his own language. And they began to be amazed and to marvel, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya, around Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were mocking, saying, They are full of sweet wine. They're a bunch of drunk people, a bunch of drunk Jews. The Jews are drunk. They don't know what they're talking about. They're talking in our languages. Why is it that when we see the manifestation of God, we automatically assume that they're crazy? Why is it that the Spirit of God cannot come upon us, America? Why does it always have to be the flesh? Why must it always be the flesh that we give credence to? Why is it that it's the flesh that we love rather than the Spirit? Maybe that's the reason why some people have not received the Holy Spirit. It is because we give so much attention to the flesh, the beauty of the flesh, the desire for the flesh. We are so filled with the flesh that the Spirit of God cannot manifest the powers of God through us in this generation. And we call them fake healers rather than faith healers. Maybe the issue is not that they're fake. Maybe the issue is that you have no faith. Do you have faith, Portlanders? Who here has faith to say Jesus is Lord? Who here has faith to say Jesus is God? Who here has faith to say Jesus is my Lord and my God? Where is our faith? If I said, who are the fags of Portland? Everybody would raise their hands. Keep your hands down. We don't need to know your sexual practices. Why is it that nobody wants to have faith and believe? So that God can manifest His power. So that God can manifest His strength through us who believe. Maybe that's the reason why churches are dying out. And everybody in the, in the pulpit is, is, is claiming to be the community rather than, you know, claiming to be the church. Did you notice that we don't have apostles today? We have pastors and teachers and elders, but where are the apostles of this apostolic faith? Why is it that it begins with apostleship, and now where are the apostles that used to manifest the power of the Holy Spirit? Where are the apostles? What happened to the faith that we had in God and His Son? Maybe that's why when it comes to Easter, we turn to the Easter bunny and the egg. Some big chocolate bunny rather than to the Son of God, the Son of creation.
So the scripture says they will pick, pick up serpents. And by the way, if you're a Christian, stay away from the snakes. The scripture says they will be unheard by poison and they'll be able to heal the sick. In Acts chapter 28, verses 1 through 6, Paul had a, a run in with a serpent. Paul had been arrested and was on his way to Rome. And uh, they had stopped at an island. I think it was the island of Malta. And a viper, while he was um, trying to get a fire going, a viper came out of nowhere and fastened itself around his hands. Quickly, what did Paul do? He shook the snake off into the fire. That is symbolic of what God is going to do with the dragon in Revelation that has seven heads, whom he calls Satan, the devil. He's going to cast him into the lake of fire. He's going to put him in the abyss for a thousand years and then into the lake of fire for all eternity. So Paul dealt with a viper and did not die. If we were to wrap up Mark chapter 16 verses 14 through 18, we see that during Jesus' 40 days stay on the earth that um, Acts 1 through 3 that he appeared to his disciples he commissioned them with the gospel the gospel of his life the gospel of his teaching the gospel of his miracles and leadership and what he had established through his disciples he gave them conditions to how how they responded and how others would respond to his gospel message those who will be blessed and those who will be condemned because they choose not to believe they were to go into the world and preach to all creation we come to uh, the last portion of of Mark 16 last two verses and then we're done with the gospel of Mark verses 19 through 20 where Mark says this so then when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God so Jesus ascended to heaven and sits at God's right hand, the very seat of authority that he had occupied 33 or 34 years prior to his incarnation. So he goes back and sits down. Who are the vice presidents of this country? When the vice president was done giving his speech, he went back into his house or into the White House and sat in his office. That's the equivalent to this. Christ being the Vice President of Heaven, the Father being the King of Kings, went back and sat at the right hand of God. And while in Heaven, the disciples went out preaching, excited, that Christ had come back and recommissioned them. And he worked with them while he confirmed what they preached with signs and wonders. You know, when you first get a business started, there's an excitement there. It's a new venture. You don't mind spending extra cash for advertisement. But then over the course of time, you allow the business to care for itself. And whatever the money that comes into that business, it is that same money that will be used for advertisement, for buying more products. What you take in, 
will result in what you put out next week. All of these businesses are like that. You go to Europe and buy new clothes. People come in and buy the clothes. You go to India and buy clothes. You go to China and buy clothes. You go to Africa and buy clothes and you put them in your stores. You come in, you buy the clothes. The money that comes in is the same money that is used for you to take another trip or to place in an order for new products to come in. At the beginning of the disciples going into the world and preaching the message, much of the power of God was displayed through the twelve, through Paul. We still preach the gospel today. Perhaps the spirit may be a bit dormant, but it doesn't mean that the spirit is not there. It requires faith for you to receive God's spirit. It requires faith in the message that is written in his gospel. Don't ever think that the God of creation can't turn from making it rain, shining his sun, creating babies in your wombs, ladies, and using your seed to multiply children, men, that he can't turn to you and bless you with his spirit when you put your faith in him. You have to take the first step in order for him to take the first step. It's a step-by-step -step process. You exercise faith, I give you the gospel, and I put the seed of salvation in you. You respond by believing. Paul and his epistle to the Roman church says, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. Do you believe? The gospel's been preached. You've heard of his life, his teaching, his death and resurrection. We have Easter celebrating 2,000 years of it. Do you believe it, Americans? You may be reserved, but whether you're reserved or not, the message still applies to you. Do you believe it? Do your, does your children believe it? Did your fathers believe it and pass on the message to you? You fathers, do you believe it? Will you pass it on to your children? Or will you let them go the way of the world so that they never know the God of their creation? And upon your absence, they become the murderers of this nation and die and go to hell rather than become the saints of this nation and enter into heaven's kingdom to meet their Lord and their God. What is holding you back from believing and taking that step of faith? I hope it's not me. I hope it's not any of us pastors, preachers, leaders, people who are preaching the gospel to you. I hope it's not sin. I hope it's not Satan. Whatever it is that is holding you back you know what Paul says? I want to read you something. Paul says this to the church of Corinth in his second letter to the Corinthians church. I believe it's 2 Corinthians 5. Paul says this. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were entreating through us as though God were entreating through us. God is entreating through us. God is asking through us. God is talking through us who preach His gospel. He is entreating through us. Doesn't your president entreat the nations of the world on your behalf, Americans? Do you not send ambassadors to the nations, to the UN, to speak on your behalf so you have good relations with the nations of the world? God is entreating through us. And what does God want? Paul says this. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Americans, we beg you. We're not forcing you. We're not pointing a gun at you. We're not beating you. We're not asking you for your bank account. We're not asking you for a sex session. We're not asking you to give your life income. We beg you on behalf of Christ. 
We beg you on behalf of this gospel. Paul talking to the generation of his people, to the church of Corinth. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to your God. That is the gospel that Jesus left behind, that door of communication. This is what God has been communicating to us through Christ and through the apostles. Be reconciled to God. You may say, for what? We're not at war. But God says you are at war. God says you are at war with heaven above because you refuse to believe. God says you are at war because you're still there is you're still stiff necked and hardening your heart. You're still saying this is not the truth. Then what is the truth? If this gospel is not the truth, you who know it all, what is the truth? You who lived in the 19th and 18th and 17th and 16th century, who knew how the world of that day began and existed. You who was there when all those people walked the face of the earth and warred against each other. You! What is the truth if this gospel of Jesus is not the truth? You! who lie to your children and tell your children that there is no Jesus and there is no God. That man is a liar. I don't want to hear it. We're the community and we want that. And we like that. And we are that. And you are so firm on that. That may be the judgment of God against sinners that you take so much comfort in. That may be the judgment of God against the sinners. Oh, if I confess to you some of the things that I have done to seek out not the Spirit of God, but the Spirit of sin. If I were to confess to you some of the places I've gone online, some of the things I've seen just on the computer where sin has taken me into the pit of hell and God upon Christ's death sends Christ into the pit of hell to preach the gospel to them where do you think he was for three days where do you think he was for three days preaching the gospel to those who were in hell so that they could be saved so Paul says be reconciled to God we beg you on behalf of Christ. On behalf of who? Of Christ. The presidency goes to Iraq and Iran. We beg you on behalf of the United States of America. Do not hit our buildings again like you did at 9-11. We beg you not to touch us as a nation. We will crush you. We beg you on behalf of Christ. You Afghanistanians. You Iranians. You Japanese at Pearl Harbor, do not touch our country. We will kill you. Are these not, are these not the words of an ambassador who stands for his nation, for his government, for his people, trying to protect them? So it is with Christ and his apostles trying to protect some of you, all of you if you could by offering you the salvation of Christ and saying be reconciled to God and receive this gospel as the truth. For there is no other name under heaven by which men are to be saved. There is no other name under heaven by which men are to be sealed, to be forgiven, to be born again. There is no other name under heaven by which men will be changed, transformed, received into heaven. Don't you want to be there at the resurrection in the future? At the resurrection of the dead? At the rapture of the church? Jesus' ministry on earth was now over with all men. He did as the Father had wanted him to do. He established a line of communication and made it the responsibility of men that is his church to save men from their sins by preaching the gospel of salvation. This gospel I've been preaching since last year. This gospel of Mark. So we conclude. 
that from the commission of the Father to the commission of the Son to the commission of the Spirit, all in agreement. From the Father to the Son to the Spirit to the church in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth, fifteenth, twentieth, twenty-first century be reconciled to God. What's stopping you from being reconciled to God? Is it your homosexuality? Is it your money? Is it your color? Is it your skin? Is it your sin? Is it your clan? Is it the devil? What is stopping you from being reconciled to God? What is stopping you from being reconciled to God? What's stopping you? Easter 2015. So God is calling you to salvation. God in Christ is now declaring, as he says in Acts chapter 17, verses through 30, that all who have heard his gospel are to repent and believe in his name. Will you? Will you come to him by faith? Will you believe in His name? Will you believe in His name? Are you going to let this generation pass by and not believe? You know, if you do believe, you simply have to pray, Father, forgive me of my sin. That's all you have to say, Father. Address Him as Father, just like Jesus says. Remember when he says to them, Our Father who art in heaven, this is how you pray. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. They need to know that prayer, by the way. Like it was taught to you when you were their age. You say, Father, forgive me of my sin. I repent of my life of sin. Use that word, repentance. I repent of my life of sin. Father, forgive me for my sin. I want to be forgiven and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, amen. It doesn't have to be a long, drawn-out, 10-hour prayer. A few words. And God will hear you. What did Jesus say to the man who was being crucified? Today you will be with me in paradise. The man didn't have to jump off the cross and serve Jesus at preaching the gospel. All he had to do is exercise faith and believe that Jesus was who he said he was. You simply have to believe. Even on your deathbed, you can do that. It's not all the works that you do. It's your heart that changes from unbelieving to believing. And if you believe, He will forgive. I want to close in prayer. And finally let you go. I don't know how you're going to spend Easter. I don't know how you're going to spend tomorrow. I don't know if I'll be here next Easter. Easter 2017 to give you this message again not sure where anybody and everybody will be some of us will be here and others of us will not you know how the seasons change but I want to pray and say Lord bless those who have received your gospel message Father may you save those who are yours and bless them with your Holy Spirit of promise. Lord, forgive their sins. Cleanse them from all unrighteousness and doubt. In Jesus' name, amen. If today was your day of salvation, you can come up, and as I'm cleaning up here, you can come up and talk to me to join His church by faith. Not through me, but through His message and through His promise that He will hear your prayer. And he will send you the Holy Spirit, a promise. There's no hocus pocus and no tricks. It's an act of faith from your heart to his. It's you saying to your creator, I believe this gospel you have sent to us. Forgive me for my unbelief. Forgive me for doubting you. Forgive me for overlooking you. Forgive me for my ignorance, Lord. I repent. Forgive me. If you already are saved and you're in need of a ministry to join or a fellowship and you want to start with me, great, come aboard. 
We will pray together. We will talk together. We will sup together. Take communion together. We will preach the gospel to the ends of the earth together like they did in the, in the, in the first century. How many churches are out here doing it? It began with them believing on the unbelieving side. And once they believed, they switched to the believing side. And then they began to live the life of faith. They purchased a copy of the gospel. That is the Bible. And they began to exercise faith by reading it. From Genesis to Revelation, understanding the whole gospel. And then when they got to the New Testament, they understood the old covenant and now the new covenant in his blood. And then what God now requires of us, once we have embraced his message, his son by faith, then we are considered and called the sons and the daughters of God. Without the Holy Spirit, you are not his, but with the Holy Spirit, you are his. And then you can begin to, to manifest your faith by getting baptized in the waters of baptism because he will baptize you with his Holy Spirit in his time when he's ready. I could lay hands and pray for you, but it's an act of God between you and your creator. And then you can start going to church meetings on Sunday mornings, Bible studies on Friday nights, like I try to have at Gretchen Kafuri Commons, but nobody ever shows up, either on Sunday mornings or Friday nights. Just like nobody ever uh, 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 respond to the messages when I give them. Because they're all afraid. Because they're all afraid of being rejected by you who don't believe. They're afraid to exercise faith because they don't want your judgment, O oh Sodom. They don't want you to reject them, O oh Gomorrah. They don't want you to fire them from their jobs. They don't want to lose their homes. They don't want to lose their income. But Jesus says, if you are not willing to lose father and mother for me, you're not worthy of me. And, G and you know, Paul says, I have lost all things for the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. If you're not, and Jesus says, if you don't receive me or you don't accept me before men, I will deny you before the Father. You see, you got to go a step. You got to step up. You got to step up. It's a step up. Faith is a step up, not a, not, a, not a step down. It's a step up to where God is. You got to step up to see, is he going to provide for me if I exercise faith? Is he going to exercise, is he going to provide for me if, if I leave my whatever lifestyle I'm living, that whatever sin I'm committing, is he going to continue to provide for me? What if I lose my partner? What if I lose my home? What if I lose... He lost heaven for 30 years just to come down and die on the cross for you and I. What do we gain? We gain eternity. So Jesus is the gospel message of this life asking you in Christ Jesus this year to give your life to him. Will you do it? Amen. Are you? Right. Did you want to pray? Yeah. Do you want me to pray for you or you want to pray yourself? It doesn't matter to me. Did you want to receive Christ? Alright. Let me pray single thing.
Do you give your life to Jesus as Lord? Yeah. And repent of your sins? Yeah. My name is Kevin. What is your name? Kevin. Your name is Kevin? Yeah. <laughs> is that every day you meet another Kevin? Uh, yeah, that's why I had to laugh. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Let's pray, Kevin. Father, I want to pray for Kevin and ask that you will uh, you will save him from his sin. Lord, I pray that uh, you will forgive him for his sin and that you will embrace him as your son in the faith. Lord, may he kneel at the foot of your cross. Father, may you cleanse him from all unrighteousness and may your spirit be upon him. Hear him now as he testifies himself that he wants to be your son. Would you like to pray? Sure, just get signed. And this I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You're welcome. Are you, uh, are you from this area? I was born here. Well, boy. Good deal. My brother lived here all his life. Okay. What is, uh, what was, what was your, uh, before you prayed, what, what was it that you, uh, you believed in? Mm, believed in God a little. Yeah. A little bit more of me lately. Is that a Bible? Oh, no. Well, actually, it's a New Testament. Hmm. That's I didn't the know that was given to me, but I even had a chance to look at it. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. definitely. You live in the area? Uh, I live in the Hollywood area. I, I, that's uh, east of here, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Okay, that's right. yeah. I think I've uh, been in that area. I knew that. I've seen it somewhere. I just wasn't sure where. Okay. Probably in the area. I haven't been to the Hollywood area for a while. Yeah, I'm trying to remember everyone. It's a little hard to do. Right. But I have seen it before. I'll probably down here. I just had it. Okay. One of the best books to, uh, that you can that you can own and have. Do you have a? You know, there's a there's a church. There's a church. There's a church in um, in the Hollywood area. I can't remember. I think it's called Mosaic. Yeah. There's a, there is a there's a there's a church in that area around 40 40 second. 41st. You should check it yeah, out. I've been going there lately. Mosaic? Yeah. Yeah, you should definitely join that church. I just had it something for <laughs> Yeah, you should definitely uh, uh, go there and, and get some instructions from them and, and uh, continue with them because that's probably closest to, to where you live. Yeah, I just had it. Catch me. Trying to find something. Yeah.